I'm an architect, a passive house designer, and I publish a blog called Passive House in Plain English. This presentation is called Love Passive House. Standards don't generally uh, rouse a lot of excitement or passion about them. They're generally just something fairly boring, fairly much in the background that you have to deal with as part of your job or your day-to-day -day life. We have ISO standards, IAN standards, ANZ standards, all sorts of standards which we need to adhere to and need to follow through for building buildings, for instance. They don't particularly make anyone excited or that interested about them unless it happens to be their particular speciality, I guess. We even have the Elron standard proposed by Lloyd Alter, which came out of a conversation on Twitter between Lloyd, myself and some other people discussing how the ideal building standard might be put together. And then we have the Passive House standard. And for some reason, the Passive House standard seems to give rise to very strong emotions from people. People love it and some people hate it. And people don't really feel so neutral about it usually. It ends up provoking very strong reactions. And for me, when I first discovered the Passive House standard, I was kind of crazy in love about it. For me, it was a real turning point in my career. From that point onwards, I wouldn't design or detail or even look at another building the same way as I had done before. For me, it was really that important, learning about the Passive House standard. I was not the first person to fall in love with Passive House, and if you haven't watched it already, then I recommend you look up on YouTube the video called So I Visited a Passive House, put out by the Belgian Passive House Association, a very entertaining and humorous look at how uh, a Passive House might work. However, falling in love, falling even crazy in love, isn't always plain sailing, and sometimes it leads in the other direction. And early on, while I was writing the blog Passive House in Plain English, I wrote this blog post called 10 Things I Hate About Passive House. And the title was directly taken off this film, 10 Things I Hate About You. And in the film, two teenagers get shoved together in, in circumstances, and in the, end they, um, in the end, they fall in love with each other, but they don't start out that way. And Passive House is a bit like that, it feels sometimes, that even if you fall in love with it, there's times when you kind of feel like you hate it. And... Um, so there's 10 things which I wrote about, 10 things which are largely uh, tongue-in-cheek, kind of take on the mindset shifts and the changes that came about for me when I was learning about Passive House and starting to design Passive House buildings. And even to date, this is still the most popular blog post on Passive House in plain English. So obviously it has captured a lot of people's passions and imagination reading about it. I'm not going to talk about things I hate about Passive House though. I'm going to share five things which I love about Passive House. The first thing I want to share that I love about Passive House is the integrity. And there's two aspects to this. The first is the integrity of eliminating the performance gap. It is a real sad state of affairs that so many of our buildings just don't live up to the expectations. We design buildings that are meant to perform a certain way and they just fall so far short of that that it's just embarrassing most of the time. And if you're an architect or a designer, you've probably had that situation like I did where I sat down with a client and had to explain to them that their building was a low energy building, even though their energy bills are much higher than their expectations, and walk away from the meeting feeling somewhat embarrassed and somewhat shamed by the fact that I'd promised a low energy building, I'd designed a low energy building, but it wasn't anywhere near what their expectations were. And of course, if you use the Passive House standard and you design to the Passive House standard, use the methodology, use PHPP, detail it properly, get it certified, then that performance gap can be all but eliminated. So the building has integrity of performance. It delivers what you promise, which is what buildings really should do. That's what people expect buildings should do. So that's the first side of the integrity of Passive House. The second side is that it is a whole standard in itself. It's a holistic standard for the performance of a building, tying together the internal environmental conditions for comfort and for well-being, and the energy requirements for that building to do that. It's not a rating system that allows you to pick and choose, allows you to gain the system to get a good looking credit when in, rea in reality the building's not much better than its neighbour. It's nothing like that. It has this integrity of being a whole standard. Either you get a passive house or you don't. You don't get a 60% passive house or a 75% passive house. And you can't game it in that way that uh, so many rating systems get games, so people pick and choose them. And if you look at a building from a green rating tool and another building from the same green rating tool, you just don't know how one building compares to another. 
If you look at a passive house building, you have a very good idea. It performs to the passive house standard. You know what that means. There's an integrity around the standard. And I want to share a project which I think exemplifies, exemplifies this very well. This is by Peter Fink Architects in uh, Germany. And you can see that this is actually a retrofit of a stock of an historic building. But it doesn't pretend any kind of um, it doesn't pretend to be any pastiche of the historic style of the building. It has very clearly defined, very clearly detailed modern elements and the historic elements of the building together. So that's the outside of it. And then a view from the inside of it, we can see there's some new things and some old things, but it has an integrity about it. And this is an Innofit certified project. The second aspect about Passive House that I love and want to talk about is comfort. As we all know, it's very easy to have a zero energy building. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a very comfortable building or a very environmentally sustainable building or any number of other things. If we just measure energy performance by itself, we don't get anywhere particularly. And buildings are meant to be for human inhabitation, for us to use, for us to feel good in, for us to be healthy in, and for us to do our work and live and play and learn and all those other things in the building. So the building's purpose is to provide something which is comfortable and healthy. And if we can do that and use low energy, then that's the perfect combination. And that is what Passive House delivers. So there's many other, um, many other energy approaches out there, but they don't tie the energy and the comfort together. And that is absolutely critical in terms of the Passive House standard and in terms of what we need to be delivering in, uh, for buildings. And the other thing is that energy efficiency and sometimes sustainability are seen as some kind of austerity, some kind of frugal way of life or frugal way of doing buildings. And the Passive House Standard is not at all like this. And a really good analogy, which I wrote about again on the blog, is this um, very Gary Vaynerchuk's approach to social media. And what he advocates is that on social media, companies should not be just marketing to try and generate sales, they should be delivering value to the people that engage with them. So he's suggesting that there should be a jab, jab, jab of give, 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 and then there should be the right hook, which is then the sales, which follows after that. So that the people they're interacting with feel like they're getting a high amount of value before they're being asked to buy anything. And the same thing really applies very well to Passive House. It's not like other energy standards, which just talk about reducing energy or generating renewable energy. It says, we want a building to be airtight, so it's comfortable. We want a building to be well insulated, so it's comfortable. We want a building to be well ventilated, so it's comfortable and healthy. All these aspects of Passive House and many other aspects of the Passive House standard are driving a comfortable, healthy, good internal space in a building for us to live and work in. And then that's combined with energy efficiency. So Passive House has this jab, jab, jab of comfort, 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 and then the right hook of energy efficiency to go with it. Nothing austere or frugal about a Passive House building. And as an example, I've picked this delightful home down in Dunedin in the southern part of New Zealand. I went to Dunedin as a child many times for family holidays every year, sometimes more than once every year. And my experience with Dunedin was that it was always cold, dark and damp, often raining, always cloudy, windy, cold, and not really a very comfortable or pleasant place to be. So I was very surprised and very uh, pleased to see this beautiful passive house down here designed by my friends at Archetype in Dunedin and how delightful this building really is with its beautiful selection of materials, the colours, the daylight coming in and how elegant and beautiful it is. And particularly these internal shots show just how wonderful and comfortable being in a passive house even in a cold, wet, damp place can be. Clearly they found a lovely, sunny, beautiful day to take the photographs on and having been there um, as an adult, I do know that Dunedin can be beautiful and sunny and warm, uh, but this building does really show just how, how comfortable a passive house can be, regardless of what the weather and the climate is like outdoors. The third aspect I want to share that I love about passive house is that of design. Too often, sustainable design and energy efficiency is something which comes after the bulk of the design process is done. This is something that an architect and an engineer doesn't necessarily consider until a large amount of the design work is already done. And by that point, it's too late. As you know, if you're designing a passive house building or any, or any energy efficient building, the form of that building, the shape, the massing, 
All those aspects are absolutely critical for the inherent efficiency of that building. If you design something which is very compact, it is inherently going to be more efficient than something which is sprawling and spread out and has a large amount of surface area compared to the internal area or internal volume. Passive House, of course, is very much about the integrated design approach, about designing for efficiency and for comfort right from the very beginning as part of the design process, not something that gets added in too late. And alongside that, sustainability and energy efficiency features are often seen as just that, features. Something that you add after you've designed a building, after you've done the work that you wanted to in terms of how the building is laid out functionally, what it looks like, the materials, and then at the end it's like, oh, let's, have, let's add some sustainability features, which of course some sustainable rating systems uh, kind of promote that idea in some ways because you get to tick a box by adding something rather than it being about the inherent performance and the inherent design of that building. And so Passive House is not about adding features. It's not about doing it too late. It's really about an integrated design process. And it is about the design from the macro scale of the massing and the shape and form of a building right down to the details of how a window is placed in a wall, how a wall junction and a floor junction is built, how the different materials and different um, components come together. All about design. And as an example of a project, to illustrate that, there's this library in Spain by Play Architects, which is, I think, a very beautiful building, set in a historic urban environment, very tight urban environment, not just on a green field with lots of um, space around it. And you can very clearly see that this is um, nothing like any kind of stereotyped, obvious passive house building. This is a library, and it's very beautifully done to give back to the public and to interact with the building and the urban fabric around it. And then the internal space is also beautiful with lovely timber and the light. And it's a real combination of everything coming together in one integrated process. There's nothing obvious here which is about building performance or about passive house or about energy efficiency or about comfort. It's all the whole thing. Everything is part of the design process, not something which is added as a feature or something which has come too late and can, can't influence the way it's designed. The fourth aspect of Passive House that I want to talk about is science. And particularly as an architect, we're sold on the idea that architecture is this beautiful combination of art and science together. It's not just art, it's not just science, it's where they really meet in a synthesis. However, for most architects and most designers, it's really about gravity. Maybe even about defying gravity, like some architects like to try and prove. Obviously, no building actually defies gravity like the uh, SpaceX rockets do. However, you, you can get the idea that that's what the architect had in mind when you look at their building, that they were attempting to defy gravity and defy physics. But of course, architecture and buildings is about so much more than just gravity, so much more than just resisting the loads of the building. And then the other aspect of science is so-called building science, which is about the thermal performance, about the moisture performance. And I actually did a building science bachelor's degree before I carried on to do the architectural part of my education. And I think that in the two weeks, or less than two weeks, that I did a passive house design course, I learned way, way, way more building science than I learned in a whole of a bachelor's degree. <laughs> And the building science which architects and building designers deal with mostly is very basic, very straightforward stuff, but again it's taken somewhat in isolation from the design process. Whereas for Passive House, the building science, the uh, moisture management, the movement of heat, the transfer of heat, the uh, air, how we manage the ventilation building, all these aspects are integral to the Passive House standard. They're part of the design process, not something separate. And to illustrate this is this very beautiful, simple and elegant building in France by Pamier Architects and Herman Kaufman Architects. Herman Kaufman, of course, very well known for doing a lot of passive house buildings. And this building doesn't make any particular show of trying to defy gravity or play any games around illustrating something to do with gravity or any other aspect of building science, really. It's a very calm building that you know because it's a passive house building, the building science is all in place that it's working as it should do. It's built with uh, timber and clad with timber on the outside, but we know because it's a, a certified passive building 
that the science of how moisture and air move through those is understood and is considered and taken care of in the design process. Science, an integral part of the Passive House standard, and I find designing Passive House buildings that I do get this feeling that actually I'm finally bringing together the art and the science of architecture, not like um, just the structural and gravity aspects of it that was what, where it sort of started out. Finally, the fifth thing I want to share about Passive House that I love is community. And I think that most of us would agree that the construction industry is often very confrontational and it's very difficult to do a good job and get something built. So often things get compromised or litigious or blame culture kind of comes in on it and it's very difficult to get a beautiful building come out the other end and everyone feel like they were actually part of that. And so when you set a very high aspirational stretch target like the Passive House Standard, which causes everyone to have to rethink how they do it, and everyone to work together and everyone to collaborate, it means that you don't have that anymore. People come together and they work because it's something of a bigger goal than what they're typically used to doing. No longer are they just doing the minimum to get by with the legal requirements, they're actually looking at something much bigger than that. And it's not something I would have uh, particularly appreciated before I started doing passive house architecture, but having done uh, a number of projects very early on, I realised this was what was happening. There was a bigger challenge than just doing a building. So people were coming together, bringing their passion and their enthusiasm, or actually starting to uh, learn enthusiasm and passion for Passive House if they were new to it. And through that process, there was less confrontation, there was more collaboration and working together. And as has often been said, Passive House is a team spirit, a team sport. We need to work together to be able to do it. Or perhaps another way of putting it is it takes a whole village to raise a child. It takes a whole team to raise a Passive House building. And then the second aspect of community, which I found really striking about designing Passive House buildings, is that people are willing to share their mistakes, willing to share their lessons, and willing to learn new ways of doing things. Because there's a purpose, there's a reason, it's not just about doing it for the sake of it. So often in the construction industry, people don't want to know about doing things differently, don't want to know about how to do something better. And then when people start to do Passive House, they get very passionate about sharing the mistakes they made, their war stories, how long they spent in the trenches before they could get a building built. And it brings everyone together. There's a real sense of camaraderie and a sense of working together as a community to deliver an outstanding building. In this project in England, in the east of England by Hampson Baron Smith, this I find a very particularly beautiful example of a community uh, sense that you get from Passive House. A little bit different take on that perhaps. But it's a grouping of small dwellings, affordable passive house houses, built in this woodland setting. And you get a sense that this could be a little village, and they could be raising children together in this village. Um, and of course they're enjoying the comfort and the very low energy bills that comes from passive house. Just another view of this, and you can see that the shapes and the materials is something very homely, something very community feeling about this particular design. So those are the five things I want to share with you about uh, why, what I love about Passive House. However, I think we need to step back also and look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is really a question of why. Why do we do Passive House? Why do we get so passionate? Why do we fall in love with Passive House? Why are we crazy in love about Passive House? And I think the reason why, certainly for me, why I fell in love with Passive House is because I want to feel that I'm making a difference. I want to feel that I'm making a positive contribution to the world. And particularly, I don't want to feel like I'm spending all my working life doing something which is I'm just getting by and then I have to find other times and other opportunities to make a difference. I want to feel like that my job, my career, my work is doing something which is making a difference. And Passive House certainly feels like it's making a very positive difference. And as we live in the Anthropocene now, as we face climate change, as we face climate breakdown, as we start to experience the effects of that directly, it's very overwhelming. It's really big. It's really something that's difficult to know. How can we possibly deal with it? What can I, as one individual, one small person, what can I do to make a difference in the Anthropocene? What can I do? And of course, climate change, the planet, our atmosphere, none of that cares about good intentions. None of it cares about the fact that we might care. The only thing that makes a difference is actually doing something that has impact. 
the outcomes of what we do and what matters. We've got to have good intentions, yes, but we've also got to take action and do something. And it's the only thing which is going to make a difference, is if we can collectively take actions and if we can do something to have a positive impact so that we can do, uh, we can prevent climate breakdown from going too far and we can bring it back. And Passive House really is impact. As I've talked about, it has this integrity. There's no performance gap. It eliminates the performance gap. Passive House delivers very low energy buildings, therefore very low carbon emissions. And at the same time, comfortable, good buildings to be in, buildings that are healthy and good for our well-being as we're in it. Passive House is something we can do, something that has impact, something we can do and we can feel that we're making a difference. I love Passive House. I hope you also love Passive House. Together, let's change the world.